Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Such early in the morning. I'm glad that at least so many people are here <laughs> so that we can talk a little bit about information literacy. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to have a talk. Um, my topic is information literacy studies and human information behavior. And um, I would like to. No, I have to. research from the qualitative point of view. And um, in the second part of the presentation, I have some examples of, of our own studies, which were also driven by this qualitative, qualitative approach, qualitative paradigm. Um, if I have time, I will conclude with some trends of uh, research in information literacy. One of my questions, in this morning was, uh, for, for this presentation was, what are the relationships between information literacy and information behavior? These topics are quite close, but um, they have many, many commonalities, and there is something which is different, which is different for, for them. On one hand, human information behavior is a very broad topic, covering multiple information activities, so which are connected with information use, uh, which are connected with adaptations to information environment, and of course, it has many cognitive, affective, and um, act, uh, um, activities which we which we are doing daily on on our daily basis. On the on the other hand, information literacy you is uh, a set of uh, knowledge, skills, and many attitudes, values, which help us. Uh, um, Make use, make efficient use of information. There are some common factors, commonalities of these two topics. One of them is uh, both are connected with users, with people who are actors in contexts, and uh, they also are connected with information needs. Because when we have inf um, some identified information need, then we can be information literate and then we usually behave. So these information needs are mainly connected with uh, cognitive information processing and social context, social communication. Many people say that it's socially constructed. As for the information process, again, it's common to information literacy and information behavior because there is information access to sources, there, are, there is organization of information either in our mind or uh, through information systems and uh, libraries, so to say. And again, there is a sort of third process, information use. What is also common is digital environment and systems which we have to use. And uh, also the, the view of uh, these uh, processes, information processing, uh, as an experience. And this, is the la this last point is uh, what is interesting for qualitative studies of information behavior and information literacy. How people experience information in the information environment. And it's not just skills, but it's the, also the holistic um, uh, position of men in the information environment. That's what was, uh, what, what is the focus of our research. So if we summarize the differences, uh, information literacy is, uh, is 
oriented or focused on understanding uh, this, these activities, development of improvements, while human information behavior is a rather broad topic uh, connected with understanding information behavior. It is connected with uh, model system services, um, which can be based on, on this knowledge. On the other hand, information literacy is connected more with uh, models, but also programs, uh, training courses, standards uh, in curricula. So again, it has a very broad application. Uh, as for my definition of, of information literacy, this is what I uh, think information literacy should be, how it should be determined. It's information practices, its values, it covers information use, understanding, and knowledge construction. I have to go back a little bit to, uh, to the history of information literacy research. And as uh, you may know, there is a quite a large community of people who are uh, involved in the information literacy research. The first one, it is the, the man on the picture was uh, uh, Mr. Paul Zukowski, who coined the term in 1974. For the first time, he determined the, the information literacy. Since then, there, there has grown a series of conferences at the information co international community, who is, um, which is um, uh, focused on the research of the information literacy. There are many uh, great names uh, to name that. Uh, some of them, for example, professors like Eisenberg, Bruce, and Weinberg, and Weber, and Gordon, and so on. And uh, there are, of, of course, many professional organizations who are, uh, which, which are oriented on uh, developing guidelines and standards, like ALA, SCONO, UNESCO, IFLA, and so on, and so on. As for more traditional approaches, they are uh, driven by skills and sets of um, stages uh, uh, which can be manifested in our information activities, processes, stages, phases. These are two models which are well known in the information literacy community based on these uh, stages. One of them is mo the model Big Six uh, by Eisenberg and Berkowitz the first one, and the second one is the model of SCOMO, the Society of Culture and National and University Libraries, which again defines seven pillars of information literacy. However, there are some alternative qualitative approaches, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, which try to understand information literacy as a set of um, experiences set of uh, mm, position of the man in the space, in the information space, in the information environment. These uh, mm, studies and research are driven by phenomenology and phenomenography, two major research methodological approaches, which are um, quite interesting and which we followed in our, our studies. Um, the first authors who tried to apply phenomenology and phenomenography to uh, information literacy research were Swedish authors and Australian authors. Uh, Louise Lindbergh, Swedish professor, and uh, Australian Christine Bruce, and Mandy Lupton, and Anne Marie Lloyd, and many others. Uh, this uh, mm, approach uh, uh, relies on the relations of two phenomena, for example. What is the relation between information use and learning, or information literacy and information seeking, or the outcomes of learning and information literacy? And uh, the experience is of information use is the most interesting, interesting topic. Of course, uh, there are some um, sources of how to uh, how to study this experience. And one of the first author was Ferenc Martin, again from, from Swedish school in Gothenburg, pedagogical school, who was the founder of this phenomenography, phenomenographic approaches. Uh, 
but there are many others apart from uh, other approaches apart from uh, from uh, the phenomenography for example socio-cognitive or socio-cultural research which tries to um, concentrate on tools which we use for um, information use and which tries to uh, to uncover the, the intercultural differences, for example, between people who should be information literate. There is this course analysis quite well known, or uh, many other, other approaches with, which um, are concentrated on the sense of communities. It's not just formal learning in schools, but also informal learning, which is uh, um, covered by these approaches. Uh, from uh, many, many qualitative approaches, I selected uh, just four examples. One of them is informed learning uh, based on previous work, uh, previous model of seven phases of financial literacy by Christine Bruce. Uh, the second one is information culture. The third one, information landscapes, and uh, the, the last, but not least, information influence. I will briefly just um, explain you one, each of these uh, approaches. Of course, there are many other hidden uh, contexts under these. As for the informed learning, uh, Professor Bruce was one who define this as the emphasis on holistic experience in information in environment, which is aimed at uh, understanding the information experience. And um, she developed six frames for information literacy education within this informed learning. This was a book which was published in 2008. These uh, frames are, are concentrated on content, competency, learning to learn, personal relevance, social impact and the relation frame. And as we all know, her previous work was um, also um, a result of phenomenographic research and she presented some phases of information literacy. Uh, her approaches uh, have some commonalities uh, in, in uh, uh, emphasis on communities. Uh, she again started to started to to develop these model models based on the research of people and their experience. But it comes not only with uh, or it is connected not only with uh, formal learning but also with uh, informal learning and participation in communities, religious communities, for example, all the communities, communities of all the people or ethnic communities. As for the information culture, it is again uh, defined as a holistic view of people and uh, their information, behavior in social and educational and economic contexts. Uh, this is definition by Sheila Weber and Bill Johnston. And, uh, and they again stressed social actions based on cultural norms. I like this definition of uh, information literacy, which says that it is the adoption of appropriate information behavior, either on personal level on, or on the level of communities and societies. Another approach uh, is uh, the approach of information landscapes, which uh, are a sort of representation of the information space, information environment in our minds and it means that wherever we, we, ha we are in the information environment, we are intuitively building the maps or, or landscape of this environment. As uh, Anne-Marie Lloyd says, the landscape is something one experiences and explores. It's an engagement which allows one to map the landscape, construct understanding. Um, so in this approach, information literacy is a source of practice. It's really very practical, connected with everyday, everyday uh, information behavior. These are some examples of information landscape. The fourth concept is the information fluency, which is again, uh, as we see, uh, really holistic, holistic uh, concept uh, 
uh, and David Bowden defined it as conceptual understanding, that ability to adapt to changing information environment. And the, uh, the, the emphasis is on understanding, understanding what is, we are trying to make sense again of the information environment. Um, and we build our information style, which is again very important for everybody who, who has grown and, and used information. Um, that's why the part of the, the, the information policy is personal info, information style, of course, it is again socially constructed. These uh, approaches and many others have uh, has been reflected in a new framework of ACRL, ACRL Information Literacy Framework 2015, which uh, says that information literacy combines a repertoire of abilities, practices, and dispositions focused on expanding one's again, understanding of the information ecosystem. It's not a set of skills or, um, or guidelines or standards, but something which is really um, deeply embedded in our uh, information behavior and in our sensing of the, the information environment. They say that with the proficiency of finding, using, analyzing information and developing new questions, new knowledge, ethical participation in communities of learning and scholarship. And this framework, framework uses the, the threshold, con threshold concepts which we uh, have heard about in the first presentation. The concepts which, uh, uh, which opens up new views on the information environment and on the topics which we try to understand. I would say that the contribution of qualitative studies uh, to information behavior and to information literacy can be in um, new, new, not only new deter determination of uh, information needs, information use, but in new models which are derived from, from these um, approaches, which are rich and uh, holistic and so on. As, and as I don't have much time, I will see some of these uh, uh, slides. This is, these are parts of visualization which, is, which, uh, which, which plays a very important part in um, the holistic, uh, holistic approaches. As for the examples of our studies, I will briefly just review some of them. Uh, we we organized several studies of information behavior in Slovakia in our department, Department of Library and Information Science in Communities University. And here I have some examples of four of them. Methodological literacy, information horizons mapping, creative information strategies, and research information literacy. For example, methodological literacy was a, a model which was derived from our qualitative studies of information practices of doctoral students. And I defined it as knowledge, skills, abilities to apply the methods, methodologies um, in, a, in one discipline or in the research projects. This is the visualization of this model of methodological literacy. Again, I used one of the visualized me visualization methods for uh, describing information horizons with uh, these doctoral students. It was part of these uh, semi semi-structured interviews. And um, these uh, pictures, these information horizons were then analyzed both quantitatively and qualitatively. And these are some examples of these uh, information horizons, which were um, described or represented by metaphors of information use, for example, growth, as you can see this uh, tree, or filtering, as you can see in the second picture, or the, the pattern of interactivity in these pictures, or the pattern of information problem solving. And based on this, we, I, I derived, or we derived the information use patterns, evolutionary, interactional, and sequential. And again, the, this can be applied to um, building um, better information systems and services. 
The third uh, um, example is creativity, creativity and information, creative information strategies. We tried to find the relations between these uh, two concepts and um, it was also based on many previous studies of my doctoral students uh, who wrote theses on creativity and uh, they made some surveys of uh, managers, scholars, artists uh, and information professionals in Slovakia. Uh, we derived this model of creating information spaces with three dimensions, problem-oriented dimension, knowledge dimension, and interactive dimension. And we also uh, derived some recommendations, for example, for those who, who should build some tools for, this, uh, for exploration of these uh, spaces, like conceptual exploration, um, conceptual navigation, conceptual structuring within these three dimensions. Uh, we think that it is important to think about creativity in relation to information literacy, not only for innovation, but also for, for handling information overall. And this is my last uh, example of uh, our study, recent study, ongoing project on information behavior of researchers. Again, we uh, interviewed 19 researchers in Slovakia from different disciplines and tried to find common patterns in um, their information behavior. We, um, in the first analysis, uh, have uh, shown that there is really much expertise with these uh, researchers and much of common critical analytical information practices, personal information styles, knowledge of methodologies, and so on. And based on this, I uh, defined the so-called research information literacy as the ability to understand and use information as complex relationships of researchers and information environment. And as we also ask them uh, the questions concerning open access and open science factor factors, this is our last model of, of this research, which um, integrates uh, expertise factors, methodological factors, and open science factors. And we have seen that in, as for the open science factors, promotion of science, there, there are still some, some um, possibilities to improve the, the, uh, the communication. My last, uh, last um, slides are uh, concerned with trends in information behavior. So which are trends in information behavior research and information literacy research? As for the information behavior research, I can see trends in contexts which are um, connected with qualitative methods. We need to know much more about information needs, where they come from, uh, we need to know much more about special communities and, for example, affective information behavior, information sharing. And of course, the large uh, trend is digital communities and social media, visualization, including visualization. As for the information literacy research, uh, again, there are trends of the holistic understanding of people's experience and information needs these special personal or expert information literacy styles and so on, new theories. My conclusion is that uh, the qualitative studies and qualitative paradigm of information literacy and human information behavior can really inform design of systems and services and um, we need uh, to think about ecological information interaction, interactions or a new information ecology. Paradigm, there are many, many applications for educating, for reskilling of library and information professionals, new services, and digital scholarship infrastructure. I thank you for your attention. Here are some references. Thank you very much. Truly to say, I'm not a librarian, didn't study at all information science. I'm graduated in sociology. So, um, I'm interested in information society development research and also um, research in digital competencies, digital habitus. 
but I hope that some of these findings may be interesting for you, as I think that the concept of uh, digital habitus may be applied also in the field of information literacy research. For example, maybe in the research of uh, the critical thinking development or um, presentation of sources, citations, whatever. Uh, I will for sure use my papers if you don't. <laughs> now, this is a very simple presentation. Well, uh, first, uh, let me first uh, introduce briefly at the basis of the concept of digital habitus. This concept is based on the classic habitus, uh, classic concept of habitus by Pierre Bourdieu. Uh, Bourdieu and Passeron are examining the French uh, education system and the educational pathways confirmed that the cultural capital of students and the pedagogical efforts of students are in relation uh, to the um, to the education and occupation of the parents, or in other words, to socio-economic status of the family. So uh, the analysis of uh, digital habitus, which is uh, the analogically applied of this uh, applyment of this classical concept, involves the analysis of uh, digital competence analogically to the area of the symbolic cultural capital. Then it covers the analysis of the digital efforts, analogically to the pedagogical efforts, it covers the area of the attitudes of students towards the school career, also the patterns of activity in practice. It may be identified through the extent and the forms of the digital participation of students, through the perception of positives and risks, connected with digital participation and also by self-reflection of the individual in digital space. And the third, finally, the third area of digital habitus covers the area of digital entrance. This is analogically to the area of the material or um, practical cultural capital examining the entrance to digital tools. So uh, in this area we examine the entrance to digital technologies or internet. Well, as the habitus is uh, discerned practically or empirically in relation to socioeconomic factors, we assume that also the digital habitus of children is being formed, being shaped by the socio-demographic factors. According to the, some of commentaries of the International Society of Development, children or the members of so-called internet or millennials generation differs not only to compare to the digital habitus of their parents, who do not like the experience with the life in the pre-internet period, but also it differs according to socio-economic factors. Well, children from the socially disadvantaged backgrounds can be recognized as, uh, not only as the digital elite or digital natives, as we know this, but also like digital aliens or strangers in the digital world. This means uh, the children with a limited use of digital technologies or who, got, uh, who get acquainted with digital technologies more formally than the so-called digital elite. So, we would like to ask in this presentation to what extent is a digital habitus of parents important in forming digital habitus of children? In what areas specifically? Uh, do, children part do parents par participate in their children's digital world? and to what extent the digital habitus of children differs by the socio-economic status of their families. And finally, what mechanisms can be applied to compensate the underdeveloped digital habitus of children with a low economic status? Uh, the empirical data that we use come from international studies. These are the national reports of the international studies that monitor the relationship between digital literacy, internet use, and the excess among children in relation to the parents' education occupation. The studies also took into account the number of books at home as the indi indicator of the home environment of children. Mm -hmm. Then they use also the empir empirical findings of the Institute for Public Affairs which uh, measure the level of the digital literacy quantitatively and the share of the digital literate within the age groups in the population. And also we use some own empirical findings and demographical data too. 
So um, what are the findings uh, of the uh, socio-demographic differences in digital habitats in case of Slovakia? As regards to the digital literacy, uh, the findings confirm that the differences in digital literacy in socio-economic comparison still persist, but, but they declined to compare the year 2011. For example, the share of digital literacy increased in the group of manual workers from 79 to 87%, with low education from 52 to 63%, in households with low socio-economic status from 55, from 55 to 61 in 2013. Uh, but even if the digital divide in the field of digital literacy declines, the impact of digital habitats as a mechanism of this intergenerational reproduction in Slovakia was confirmed. According to the studies, students with better quality of home backgrounds, it means with higher level of education of parents, higher status of working parents, or a greater number of books in home, achieve better results in computer and information literacy. The significant difference was also confirmed in relation to digital entrance at home. 97% of Slovak pupils, according to studies, have got the entrance to internet to compare to 3% who lack this entrance, entrance to internet at home. Also, children who do not have access to internet at home achieve significantly uh, uh, worse results uh, in digital literacy. These uh, quantitative results were confirmed also by qualitative assessment, by PIAC study, which uh, measured the uh, use of uh, digital competencies in practice. In the field of digital assets, factors of education and occupation of parents, place of residence, or income level affect the intensity of internet use by parents and also perception of positive aspects and risks of this digital participation. Uh, according to the findings of Institute for Public Affairs, the awareness of parents about the digital children's participation is higher among parents with higher education, mentally working parents, while the older parents, less educated, manual workers, the unemployed, parents from poor households more likely are not able to follow their children's activities in the digital world because of the lack of digital competencies. So part of parents still do not have necessary digital competencies to accompany their children in the digital world. And it is um, the parental mediation, parental mediation, which is socially differentiated, that is very important in the development of critical thinking also, uh, in the development of the ability of reflecting, processing information. Uh, but however, according to the experts, it is not only these structural determinants that act as a primary prevention of the risks in the digital world. For example, the dependency of children on the, on the internet can be identified according to the psychology uh, experts as a very um, common thread uh, among the children of uh, busy parents, hard-working parents. So we see that socioeconomic status uh, do not act as a primary pre uh, prevention or factor of protection of the safety of children in the digital world. There are also other factors. Mm. Uh, well, so are, what are the possibilities to compensate the underdeveloped digital habitats of children with low economic status? We would like to emphasize this potential of education system in this area. Uh, well, the use of digital technology in formal education system has been studied, for example, in the field of electronic books and its use and its contribution to the development of reading skills and graphomotoric skills. And the observations of the impacts of uh, e-books on children confirmed the improvements in this course in reading literacy achieved by children from families with higher socioeconomic status and also of children with low economic status. And this in a situation when children from families with low economic status are disadvantaged in critical reading skills. Mm. We know that children from families with low economic status more often have uh, lower levels of home literacy environment identified through the frequency of parental reading to young children, the number of children's books in homes, and the parental knowledge of books. 
So the use of e-books um, has brought a noticeable improvement among children from these disadvantaged backgrounds who, who are able to make a significant progress in reading skills uh, through the engaging in very motivating and brief uh, uh, activities presented in these uh, e-books. According to the experiences of the pedagogical assistants in Slovakia who work among Roma pupils, uh, the use of digital tools during class and after school uh, can su successfully support the efforts and confidence of uh, children. It acts as a positive motivation for children and this develops their interest and efforts. Also by the qualitative study in a Slovak primary school, which was located in the vicinity of socially excluded Roma locality, these teachers greatly appreciated the contribution of the digital technologies among this group of children. As uh, Roma pupils generally do not read, they do not listen to the interpretation, the use of digital technologies make us mm, mm, very visually and experiential, and this is what these children with a lack of experience need. Uh, According to the uh, teachers, uh, children uh, are skilled, they own smartphones, but the problem is that in this um, Roma, Roma locality there are problems with internet ent entrance, so we are witnessing the signs of digital divide in this field. The best environment for the students to come to internet is uh, to come to school in the afternoon and uh, there is a uh, computer room which is open daily until 4 p.m. and maybe attended daily. So usually children go home for lunch and then they are very glad to come back and uh, to use internet to prepare for school. Um, the, there are very challenges, great challenges in this area because we should gain more data, more quantitative data and study deeply what activities children are engaged when being online at school. As uh, confirmed by foreign studies, uh, there are differences between schools. The schools with a higher percentage of children with low economic status prefer very different um, applications, <laughs> different software. Not so creative, not so independent, sophisticated, but even these practical softwares can be very useful to, to, uh, for uh, this group of children. Uh, okay, uh, finally, maybe um, to stress the use of internet as a learning aid among children, we collected some um, data uh, this spring in five uh, schools, primary schools in Bratislava, and um, according to these findings, we, we see that uh, searching for information was marked uh, in very um, few cases. Only 8% of students, uh, people on the primary school, said that they never use uh, internet to search information and preparing for school. We see that the more children are online, the more they focus on entertainment and uh, they would uh, watch videos on YouTube and play games maybe and communicate on per per perhaps with friends. But uh, this opportunity was at least marked as the activity that they never do being online. So we see that really in, uh, the internet is important for preparing for school currently and we need to compensate the uh, lack of entrance, lack of, uh, lack of uh, internet uh, for these children at uh, home. Um, well, I have some data, <laughs> of course, uh, about the intergenerational um, development of the digital gap in this field, but uh, perhaps maybe some data will be available in the article because of the lack of time. Well, finally, thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming. Okay. <laughs> Good morning and welcome, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> It was very interesting uh, to listen uh, to all the presentations yesterday and today, and uh, I feel much better uh, to show you uh, uh, some uh, information and some research data about our students, university students, and uh, their uh, information literacy. Uh, compared to the, to the other uh, surveys and other researches, uh, I think it will be quite uh, interesting. Um, 
First of all, I would like to uh, start with this quotation. Maybe some of you already heard it or, or saw it. Uh, I, I saw it on the, in the Dubrovnik conference uh, two years ago. Um, this uh, quotation is from Arjen Toffler, um, and he stated it uh, in the 1970s, so quite far beyond uh, in the time. And it, it's so up to date uh, these days, when we are talking about information literacy, that I felt uh, we would like, uh, it, would, it will be a good start uh, to my talk. We must, um, what shall we do at the university? What shall we do in schools? What shall we do as librarians or as teachers? Um, we have to teach our students in different ages uh, how to learn, how to deal with information, how to uh, build this information into uh, the uh, knowledge structure. Uh, and I think this is the most important uh, task of uh, these days. If we look, at, if we have a look uh, at the most important 20th century, uh, 21st century skills, we see that maybe uh, some, uh, somehow all of them are, are somehow uh, connected to information literacy because or communication, critical thinking, creativity, or information and media fluency are those elements of information literacy which are um, also elements of the most important 21st century skills. So we have to deal with this topic. In Hungary, uh, and I don't know about your countries, we have some difficulties with the terminology. Uh, until now, we uh, are in there is no um, common sense uh, how to call in Hungarian this, uh, com uh, this uh, complex uh, uh, knowledge uh, as uh, information literacy. Some of them treat it uh, as something which is connected to education, uh, others uh, connected to the competencies, um, but uh, mainly majority of people connected to digital uh, literacy. And my personal view is that uh, digital literacy is only part of information literacy, so I would like to look at the problem uh, in a more holistic uh, uh, approach, with a more holistic approach. Uh, if you look uh, uh, at the landscape of uh, information literacy, just for a very short moment, uh, you can see, and I think you all know it, uh, that uh, digital literacy is a little bit different than uh, information literacy or media literacy, and we should uh, deal with all of these uh, different kinds of literacies under the umbrella of uh, information literacy altogether. So what we are talking about very shortly, uh, we all know who is information literate person, who knows what information is missing, who knows how to learn, what to do with, uh, with the knowledge, uh, how to find the information, where to find the information, how to organize and how to use uh, this information. Uh, and uh, finally, before I talk about our survey, this is the chart of the UNESCO about media and information literacy, which gives you a, a very broad uh, approach, a very broad view about what we are talking about, what kind of skills uh, needs a person to call him information literate. Uh, these skills should be in the hand of our students when they are coming to the university. But unfortunately, and I think it's true uh, for all of our countries, it is not the, uh, not the situation really. Uh, <coughs> we did a research in two, day, two years ago, and we finished it uh, last year, uh, about uh, information literacy competencies um, of university students in Hungary. It was a complex research. We wanted uh, to collect data about information literacy uh, competencies, not only of students, but also people, young people, already working on, in the labor market. Um, 
those people, those young people who have a university degree, so not uh, workers, but uh, uh, educated people. <clears throat> we wanted to develop uh, some kind of indicators to the different levels of information literacy, uh, especially in the case of Hungary. Uh, we wanted to create a new development models according to the needs of the target population and also we wanted to create a knowledge base connected to information literacy so we created a, a website uh, where we collect uh, all these kind of uh, information and developments we have already made. Now I will talk only about uh, the survey, not the whole project. This survey was taken in, uh, in 2014, and the number of answers we had uh, was nearly 2,600. I think this is quite a big number, comparing to the uh, size of Hungary and to the size of um, uh, Hungarian universities. So we were very happy with these numbers of answers. Uh, uh, we got a quite clear picture about uh, information seeking behavior and information literacy of students. Uh, we got answers for, from almost all universities all around the country. Uh, some of them gave more, some uh, less, but uh, the picture is quite uh, broad. And uh, we got also answers from uh, workers. Uh, about two, two thirds of the answers um, came from the students, and one third from the employees. <coughs> and uh, one question was if uh, the student or the person, the answerer, uh, has already participated on any kind of courses related to information literacy or libraries, library usage courses or things like that, it was uh, more than half, half of the people who uh, participated in these kind of courses. Our survey consisted of uh, 64 questions, different kinds of questions, and I will show you some interesting uh, results, not the whole, of course, because we have no time for that. Uh, one question was, where do you search information uh, for the everyday life? And the other question on the next slide will come, uh, for your studies and work. Uh, very interesting if you look at the picture uh, that majority uh, of the people uh, like to find uh, information not on different, from different information resources but from people, from friends, colleagues or maybe um, internet uh, communities. Not from the media because radio, TV and journals are very few. Uh, internet search engines are quite big, and library, unfortunately, is uh, also quite small uh, part of these uh, answers. What, what is the situation with the, with the studies? Uh, for the studies, people also like to ask information from their friends. Friends, colleagues are a big proportion. Internet search engines is a big proportion, and books are also quite, uh, this is research databases, reference databases, and also books are uh, quite a big uh, proportion, and unfortunately, uh, library is, uh, has appeared on the scene, so we see it's bigger than was before. But it's an interesting tendency that students like to ask each other when they need information, uh, or for studies, or for, uh, or for uh, everyday life. We ask what do they use the internet for? It's also interesting. If you look, uh, they use the, interesting, uh, the internet mainly for research and study, or work, and social relations. Email, Skype, chat, Facebook. Uh, not so much for games, not so much uh, for uh, everyday administration and uh, not so much for getting politics, economic or any kind of news. I think it's also uh, interesting new tendencies. Of course, we wanted to know how do they use the new um, devices, how can they search for the information. Uh, the picture is quite sad. They 
<coughs> they uh, can't search. Uh, they can't make complex searches, unfortunately. Uh, they, the majority doesn't use Boolean operators, so they don't uh, uh, connect with and search um, uh, elements. They evaluate the hits, but at the same time, they, the majority, or not the majority, but a uh, very lot of people are satisfied with the first 10 hits, which means they really don't evaluate. <laughs> Uh, if you look at what is difficult for them in a research, uh, the most difficult is how to start, which means it's difficult for them to formulate the question, what is the problem, uh, the research question or the, uh, the information need. Difficult is uh, defining the end, whether I'm done or not, whether I'm finished or not. And it's difficult to uh, decide about the credibility of the sources, selecting and evaluating the hits. These are the most difficult parts of, uh, the, for the students in the research. Which sources do they use the more? Just uh, very shortly because I'm running out of time. Uh, they use mainly Wikipedia, Facebook, so the modern devices, but at the same time they trust more those sources which they are not using. You know, just a picture there. They are not using these, but they are trusting the most uh, those uh, sources which they are not using. They know what to trust, but they are not using it. It's very interesting. Uh, and also, we, are, we asked about the authenticity of the different sources, and uh, let, uh, here you can see that they see uh, library catalogs and library uh, and books uh, are very authentic, very reliable sources. So they know what to do, but they don't do it. Uh, they use mainly textbook and course material for studying, a little bit less internet material, and less books and journal articles. This is modern times. Um, we have to find something else. <clears throat> Whom they, do they ask help? They ask help from everybody in, except for the librarian. So, <laughs> unfortunately, not very few, but uh, it's not a big portion. So they don't like to ask uh, help from us. What do they use the library for? Uh, sorry, I think it's a very important question. Uh, I, am not, I have no time uh, to analyze it deeply, just showing you that majority of students use our libraries for study, work, and research, and getting some culture uh, information. Reading, recreation, and all other social relations coming together and all these things are not important for them. If, they, if we associate with library, it is uh, study, work, and research. So I'm ready, and I am running. Um, another uh, interesting question, what do they think about different concepts? For example, plagiarism. Um, very sad, our students doesn't, don't know what is plagiarism. Uh, they think plagiarism is uh, um, copying, very, uh, a lot of people said copying, or stating uh, somebody else's work as my own. But about uh, citation and uh, having the source, uh, uh, they, uh, they didn't mention, or, or very few people mentioned only, in intellectual property, for example. They also don't know very much what is information literacy, of course, uh, ma mainly associated with the finding the information or use the information, but very few the ethical use of the information. So the major findings, just in a few words, uh, our students uh, know how to do research, know uh, what are the main issues, but uh, have difficulties uh, with the most important things, how to formulate questions, how to decide about the result, how to evaluate the sources, how to use the modern technology for really uh, important uh, research works, uh, how to identify relevant things. Uh, they mainly use Google, which isn't a problem, but uh, uh, they 
bless you with books and, and uh, journals, uh, mainly journals. And uh, for Hungarian students, it's very important that uh, the result will be in Hungarian. I made a chart which uh, I just show you about uh, what are the uh, weakness, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of information literacy in Hungary. You can uh, read it quickly. Uh, I think that we are not, not uh, in a bad situation, but uh, we need uh, very intensive development work in this field. And, uh, uh, what we need, really need uh, a more intensive political and uh, inside uh, um, motivation um, uh, how to develop media and information literacy in education. We should uh, include it in our uh, uh, curriculum, uh, in, our, in the policy, uh, and also in the media and information supply. Uh, and then the civil society. And I would like to finish my presentation also with Arvin Toffler, who said, uh, by instructing students how to learn, unlearn, and relearn, is a powerful new dimension can be added uh, to education. Thank you for your attention. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Pavla. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I just want to clarify, I used to be a chair of the working group. Now my colleague, uh, Lenka Bielhovkova, is it? Uh, and, but I'm still affiliated with the group. And also, I, although I'm here uh, by myself now, I will be presenting on behalf of my wonderful colleagues from IVIC working group, because this would never be uh, able uh, to be presented and done without many people working on it. Uh, just a brief introduction to those of you who don't know about the Association of Libraries of Czech Universities and a uh, working group uh, for information education and information literacy called IVIC. It's a Czech abbreviation and it's quite oftenly uh, used. Actually, the working group has been established before the association already in 2000, but then, uh, then when in 2002 the Association of Libraries of Czech Universities was established, kind of naturally the working group uh, became uh, part of it. Uh, IVIC is a very useful platform for many uh, people from academic and also special libraries uh, who are interested in topic of information literacy and information education. We are not limited only to librarians from academic libraries that are members of the association. We are pretty much open to anybody who is interested and want to participate and share her or his experiences. So we have members from national Library of Medicine from National Library of Technology and in the past there were also members from different other libraries than academic libraries. Among the activities of the EBIC Working Group, there are many kind of practical things and also theoretical things. About, uh, among the other, uh, among, among the theoretical things, I would like to name uh, creating the model of information literacy, also standards for information literacy of the university student, and then the strategy for information literacy development in uh, higher education in Czech Republic. Uh, many workshops are taking place every year and there's also an annual workshop uh, every September called just simply uh, EBI. Uh, overall, uh, being part of uh, this working group has been a very interesting journey over the past almost 16 years already when you could kind of follow different waves of theory and practice complementing each other. Uh, and today I would like to focus on the research activities that are part of the theoric, theoretical uh, uh, wave that we are kind of surfing on from time to time. Uh, there are two major research activities that we are focusing on. One is monitoring the activities 
um, that are part of information literacy development, the process that we call information education or information literacy education uh, that are taking place at the academic libraries in Czech Republic. They are mostly public libraries. I will get to that later. And the other big part is uh, researching or monitoring the level of information literacy of students of uh, our universities. So uh, that's something from, uh, that my colleague was talking about, something very similar. I will start with that because uh, this is something I won't get into much detailed. I will focus then on monitoring the activities. But uh, when we want to create classes, courses, teaching materials for our stu students, we need to know their level of uh, information literacy. You can do it individually within you know, every course you are teaching using some kind of pretest or interviews with the students to find out what their level of information literacy is, uh, roughly. But we try to do it on really kind of nationwide level to see what's the state as, uh, as for today. Uh, we already tried to do two smaller, we called it pilot surveys in 2004 and 2005. These were uh, meant to uh, test the questionnaire, test the methodology that we chose uh, in cooperation with the sociologists to do this survey. And we were doing these pilot surveys with the large nationwide survey in mind, but of course we didn't expect it's going to take like 10 years to do that uh, a nationwide survey for many reasons, mostly financial. But uh, finally it happened last year, we did a large nationwide survey of the level of information literacy of the students at the universities. There were 17 uh, universities uh, out of 26 public universities that are in Czech Republic involved in this uh, survey. Uh, uh, you can see the number 118 faculties. In Czech, faculta means like a part of the university, like faculty of law, faculty of medicine. So these were 118 faculties uh, from these 17 universities. And uh, uh, in total, we got more than 25,000 filled questionnaires from the students. And the uh, sociologists did a very detailed analy uh, data analysis on these questionnaires. Uh, there, was a, there were overall summary results for the entire survey, and then also every participating university got its uh, own institutional report, which is very valuable for every university, for the library, because then we can see what are, what is the level of information literacy of our students, what are the most critical factors that influence their uh, information literacy. If, let's say, participating in the IL courses provided by the library uh, make actually some change if students who participated in the courses are more information literate than the others. So this is very valu uh, valuable. Uh, the detailed report uh, is now has been finished actually like two weeks ago and is in peer review and the uh, presentation about the methodology and the results will be uh, given at the European Conference on Information Literacy that will take uh, place in Prague this October. And uh, hopefully also the, the report will be, uh, will be published. So I, I won't go in much detail, but I can answer your questions here or later during the coffee break if you have some. Now I will focus on the surveys that we do regularly and that help us monitor how our uh, how developing our uh, academic libraries, their information literacy courses, programs, how uh, our academic librarians, teaching librarians working on their teaching competences, what are the barriers that they encounter while, tra while trying to uh, develop their, their programs. Since 2006, uh, our working group is doing biannual survey 
so every other year we uh, distribute the survey to the academic libraries, mostly public, but from time to time some of the private universities or their libraries uh, get involved. In 2010, we were uh, we were publishing we published a summary for the years 2006, 8, and 10. It was in pro in flow, but it was in Czech. Uh, um, we use an online questionnaire uh, for that. It's always in April or May, and the last uh, survey was done last week, uh, May 31st. It was closed, so we have some of the results I will be presenting here are still kind of hot, fresh from the oven. Uh, we have a set, stable set of questions for that questionnaire, but every uh, Every time when we do uh, the survey, we add some uh, ad hoc questions that kind of react on something that's uh, very actual for that moment. Let's say when there was a strategy of uh, information literacy development in our universities published by the IVI group, we wanted to ask the librarians if it was useful for them, how did they inc incorporate that into their everyday work. Uh, so this was one of the typical examples. Uh, by monitoring uh, the information literacy activities for quite a long time already, we have a chance to see some trends, we can do comparisons, and it, it's really starting uh, to, be, uh, to be very interesting, and it's also a very good feedback on the work uh, that we are doing as a, as a working group, and we very often get inspiration for topics for our workshops or topics for the annual seminar that we, uh, that we organize uh, every year. Just to give you an idea what kind of questions we ask uh, our fellow uh, academic librarians, there are of course some of the demographic questions, what university is it, how many libraries, the departmental or central library uh, is there, how many employees are uh, at the library. Uh, and also how many librarians uh, spend most of their working time uh, uh, focusing on information literacy. Also we try to see the library and its information literacy program in context of the entire university. Uh, uh, we ask if the library, if the information literacy is part of the university mission or something that we call a long-term plan, which is very important and I will get back to that. Uh, also, we ask libraries if they are involved in any kind of projects or grants that are focusing on information literacy and if there are particular push positions, coordination, coordinators of information literacy courses or in entire departments that would be focusing on information education. Then, of course, there are the traditional and also kind of key uh, questions uh, asking how many events, teaching or educational events have been done over the past two years, if there is e-learning, what kind of formats of information education the library is using, and also some kind of numbers and statistics, how many participants took part in it and uh, how many hours uh, did the librarians spend uh, teaching. Uh, very important is to ask about the, or something that we are very interested in, is the level of cooperation with teachers, uh, the faculty members, uh, and also the way how the teaching librarians improve their competencies if they take part in some kind of professional development regarding their, especially the, the teaching uh, competencies. And as I already said, we also ask for feedback on, uh, on our work. Uh, I will now uh, present some of the results that I thought might be interesting for you, and the, the detailed summary will be in, uh, in, the, in the article. Uh, as I said, last survey was conducted on May 30th, uh, concluded on May 31st, uh, it means last week. Uh, uh, mostly the public universities take part in the survey and it's usually between 50 to 73, 75% of the uh, libraries taking part over the past 
uh, 10 years that we have been doing it. Uh, what we see as kind of obstacle or difficulty during collecting data, uh, these are especially the large universities that don't have a central library. They have many uh, faculty libraries or departmental libraries like Masaryk University here in Brno or Charles University in Prague. And it's very, very difficult for librarians to kind of put all the, uh, uh, all the results and all the numbers uh, together. So sometimes we have trouble to analyze this kind of data. Also, over the time, new uh, formats of information education, also new topics uh, are included or have been included into uh, the academic library's activities. And uh, so it's, we, we cannot uh, kind of compare it to anything because it's just happened to be there now and it has never been in the, in the results before that. And of course, it's a quantitative data and we all know the limits of the uh, quantitative uh, research, but for us it's a good uh, way how to get kind of broad, uh, broad idea of what's going on. Uh, I mentioned the long-term plan. It's some kind of strategic document that every university must have. It's a, it's a mandatory thing. Uh, the structure of the long-term plan uh, is uh, given by the Ministry of Education, and there is like a long-term long thing for several years, and every year there is like an update for that particular year. It's a very in important to have certain topics as a part of this mission, the long-term plan, because then it's easier to relate uh, certain uh, projects or grants to that topic because you can prove that it's really something that the university is focusing on and is determined to develop. So uh, it's very good to have the topic of information literacy as a part of the university long-term plan. And you can see that between the year 2006 and 2016, the number of universities that have information literacy in, uh, literacy in this strategic document has uh, uh, risen. Also, very interesting is development in terms of how many people are uh, involved in uh, information education activities of that particular library. And if there is uh, a person who is kind of covering or coordinating these activities. In 2006, uh, about 20% of libraries have a person who, would, who they could call like a coordinator of information literacy activities. Uh, then around 2010, we started to get 100% answer, like every single library had somebody who was in charge of the education activities. So then we had to change this question and we already started to ask if there is actually a particular department in the library focusing on information literacy and you can see the newest number from 2016 is that almost half of the library already have the entire department focusing on uh, educational activities and that's one of the major developments that we can see. Uh, uh, very interesting is to see how, what, what kind of target groups our educational events are focusing on. Uh, the top three is always first year students, students working on bachelor and master thesis and doctoral students. But over the past uh, four, six years, we can see new uh, target groups like distance program students, international students, and students with special educational needs. Uh, which is also very interesting and it's very tricky. These are groups that are very tricky uh, to kind of cover by our educational activities. So it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge. And last thing, last thing that I want to uh, point out is the level uh, of cooperation with the faculty members, with the teachers. You can see that now it's already like every library works with the, with the teachers and uh, they know that it's a crucial thing to embed or integrate at least the information literacy into the study programs, into the curriculum. 
uh, some of the barriers. Uh, usually the librarians uh, point out internal and external barriers. Uh, you can see the internal, these are the typical ones. The external is mostly you know, the lack of students' motivation to, to improve, uh, the uh, lack of motivation from the side of the teachers uh, that would motivate students to work with information literacies, uh, information resources other than textbooks, etc. So uh, these are uh, kind of hopefully the most interesting results. Uh, you can ask for more detailed uh, results, me now or me via email or my colleague, the chair of the group, over the email. And of course, hopefully it will be in the conference paper as well. So thank you for your attention.